cursos únicos no Brasil e na América Latina. Em breve, aulas presenciais. likely idea of gazing into laser light to test your eyes. Well, needless to say, it's a very safe, low-power laser, and you don't actually stare into the beam itself, but at the very distinctive sparkling effect, which is produced when the light hits any surface. Well, the surface used in the machine is this. It's a drum, and embedded in it are thousands of fragments of glass and they give a very precise speckle pattern. So here's the machine. The drum sits in the back and the laser comes from out of here and it's then spread out by this mirror. All the time the drum turns imperceptibly slowly so that that sparkling pattern is actually moving downwards. But how can this test your eyesight? Well, if you can imagine that this is the downward moving light as it enters the lens of the eye, it's focused just here. Well, if you've got perfect vision, the light is focused on the retina represented by this screen and the light doesn't move. But if you're long sighted, the lens would only focus the light behind it. Well, now you can see that there's a downward movement of light. A short-sighted eye will only focus in front of the retina. And as the rays now cross, there's an upward movement of light. Well, of course, the brain always inverts images on the retina. So that means that the simple eye test is, if you can see an upward movement, you're long-sighted. And a downward movement means you're short-sighted. If there's no movement at all, you're lucky because you have normal vision. By changing the speed at which a copper stencil moves through a laser beam, it's possible to burn out a map of Britain or etch it out in grooves. The fierce heat of the laser will blast its way through most things, but because its strength can be so finely controlled, it can cut even delicate materials with precision. In some operating theatres, surgeons are trying out laser scalpels. The incision remains clean because the laser's heat seals the blood vessels. And the hope is that by sealing off an area like this, a laser may prevent cells spreading from the diseased area to other parts of the body.
The fact that a laser will cut grooves of a precisely determined depth and separation has suggested a way of updating one of the largest of our industries. The colour is laid on the print in the printing press by a combination of ink and copper plate. In it are tiny wells which hold the ink, and it's their depth which determines the intensity of the printed colour. The problem is that the present method of etching the wells in the copper is laborious and expensive. But it's been in use since the 19th century, so it took a piece of radical rethinking to bring it up to date. A transparency of the design for a postage stamp is attached to a cylinder. It's the master which will be copied during the printing process. A sophisticated but quite conventional scanner analyzes the depth of color as it flashes past. And what the scanner sees in one place, it orders up in another. On a new plastic cylinder, a laser is burning a groove. The groove will hold the ink and its depth is controlled by the scanner. When the colour is dark, it orders the laser to burn a deep groove. When the colour is light, a shallow one. Normally, the image etched by the laser would barely show. But here, the printing cylinder has been specially treated so we can see the result. On the real plate, it takes careful lighting to show up the very fine grooves from which the image is made. Ink will flow in and out of them during the printing process. These new prints are so cheap to prepare that they're ideal for mass production. Yet here, as in many other sectors of industry, the laser produces results of unbeatable quality. The laser vision disc at the heart of laser vision technology. It measures 30 centimeters in diameter and plays at up to 1,500 revolutions per minute. The laser vision reflective spiral track is read optically by a laser beam locked onto the track, but with no mechanical contact between the disc and optical system. So it is possible to jump forwards and backwards across a laser vision disc at great speed and impossible to wear it out. So fine is this spiral that one hair from your head would cover 30 laser vision tracks. Yet the laser's path along this minute track is so accurate, it is equivalent to driving a car through a cement tunnel at 100 kilometers per hour with only one millimeter clearance on either side. And so concentrated is the reflective spiral track that if you could unwind a laser vision disc, the track would measure more than 30 kilometers. One disc can hold over 100,000 broadcast quality color frames and two distinct high fidelity audio channels. These frames can be played to produce moving pictures or they can be used individually like pages in a book. In fact, the disc is one of the densest storage mediums in the world today. But does this density make the information difficult to find? Each picture or page on a laser vision disc has its own electronic address, allowing you controlled access to each and every frame in about four seconds. The performance of an optical instrument depends, among other things, on the quality of the lenses in it. Lens manufacture is highly specialized and requires great skill. The glass arrives from the manufacturers, ready cut into discs. First, the basic shape of the lens is formed. 
the partially formed lenses are sprayed black to aid later examination. Wax is heated and shaped in a flame and the lens mounted on it for support during polishing. Polishing techniques have not changed much over the last century. The individual lenses are first mounted onto blocks. Before polishing, the lens has a matte finish. Polishing produces a transparent surface. This is achieved by rotating the block of lenses under an oscillating polishing arm. The operator adds polishing compound when required. He inspects the lens by holding it against a test plate. After the lens has been polished on both sides, it is optically centered and the edges ground the final stage of manufacture. A great deal of thought and skill goes into the design and production of optical instruments. They must perform well, meet other specifications such as robustness, and be attractive too. Optical instruments contain many different parts and are designed to make manufacture as easy as possible. Computer controlled machines carry out a range of different operations and can easily be reprogrammed to make other components. Certain components are machined on lathes. The final cut is carried out with a diamond tip tool to produce a good finish. Scales and numbers are produced by engraving. The lenses, which have been manufactured separately, are mounted into their turrets. The outside of the instrument is painted to give an attractive and durable finish. When all the components have been manufactured, mechanical assembly takes place. Here, a microscope stage is being fitted. For the microscope to function effectively, the stage must be accurately aligned. Then final assembly, when the lenses are fitted and the product is cleaned and tested, ready for the customer. This film, which was made in the late 1950s, shows the operation of the Birch mirror figuring machine, which is displayed in this gallery. In making an optical mirror, the starting point is a blank which has been ground to roughly the correct shape. It is then slowly figured, ground and then polished, to an accurate shape by a tool whose profile matches the one required in the mirror. 
The tool is at the top. Birch's mirrors were almost ellipsoidal, roughly the shape of half a rugby ball. The movements which were needed to figure them were complex. The machinery which produced them was equally complicated. Despite all the wheels and pulleys, the machine had to be continuously adjusted by Dr. Birch himself. From time to time, the movements had to be altered so that a different part of the mirror could be figured. It comes as little surprise to learn that he possessed an unusually high degree of manual dexterity. Indeed, no one else has been able to operate his machine in a satisfactory way. And here is Dr. Birch leaving the physics department of Bristol University, whom we thank for providing this film. The behavior of light waves can be simulated in water with a ripple tank. Light from a given source has a measurable wavelength. An object whose width is greater than half the wavelength of light distorts the pattern of the wave movement, and so the eye can see it. But a smaller object hardly deflects the wave movement. This means it cannot be seen. To see and magnify such small objects we must find an alternative to light with a shorter wavelength. With light, glass lenses are used to focus the beam. A stream of electrons in a cathode ray tube has a wavelength thousands of times shorter than that of light and it can be focused with an electromagnetic coil. As the current in the coil varies, the beam is brought in and out of focus. Thus, an electromagnet provides a new kind of lens for focusing a beam of electrons traveling along its axis. It makes possible an electron microscope. What is needed? First, an electron gun to produce a stream of electrons an electromagnetic lens to act as a condenser, focusing the stream onto the object to be examined. The electrons pass through the object as light passes through a slide. Then another magnetic lens, the objective, to create an intermediate image. Finally, a magnetic projector lens to throw a further enlarged image onto a fluorescent screen or a photographic plate. The electron gun must work in a vacuum. So the column must be solid and vacuum tight, with the fluorescent screen viewed through a window. Here is a modern electron microscope. The cable at the top is connected to a high voltage electrical supply, up to 100,000 volts. Inside the casing is the electron gun. The electron beam is emitted by a heated V-shaped filament mounted in the cathode. Electrons are attracted to the highly polished anode. They pass through the hole in the anode plate and on down the column. Below the anode plate is the condenser lens, which focuses the electrons onto the specimen. All the lenses are simply electromagnetic coils in metal cases. Below the condenser lens is the specimen chamber with its window and door. 
In the chamber is an airlock which can be pumped out. The specimen itself is put in the little copper holder mounted on a grid. The grid is so small that it is difficult to see the grid squares without a magnifying glass. Below the specimen stage is the objective lens. The image is focused by varying the current in this lens. There are two projector lenses at the bottom of the column. Below them is the viewing chamber. The image is projected onto the viewing screen, which can be raised to expose a photographic plate. The resolution of photographic emulsion is normally at least six times that of the human eye, so that an enlarged photograph reveals more detail than can be seen on the viewing screen. The electrons cannot penetrate more than a millimeter in air, but in the microscope they must travel from the electron gun to the viewing screen. If a heavy current is passed through two carbon electrodes in a vacuum, carbon will condense on a slide beneath. The carbon forms a sheet 20 millionths of a millimeter thick, which can be floated off. It is thin enough to be easily penetrated by a beam of electrons, so it can act as a support for specimens many times smaller than the holes in the grid. A suspension of latex rubber is being examined. The rubber is supported by the carbon layer. Preparing specimens for the electron microscope is a painstaking job because everything is so minute. The next step is to put the holder into the specimen chamber, close the airlock and pump it out. At the lowest magnification, the squares of the specimen grid are visible. The operator selects one square. Already the latex particles can be seen sitting on the layer of carbon. At 20,000 times, Magnification is changed to the higher range. We can see that spongy latex rubber is actually built up of very many small spherical particles, each about a thousandth of a millimeter in diameter. Magnification on the microscope screen, 36,000. A freshly broken piece of plate glass is one of the sharpest cutting edges known. It can be used to shave off sections of plant and animal tissue so thin that an electron beam will pass through them. The cutting instrument is called an ultramicrotome. The slices are 10 to 30 millionths of a millimeter thick. The thickness of a slice is judged by its interference color. Normally, the tissue is embedded in a plastic support. Thin tissue sections allow the botanist or the anatomist to observe structure and ways of growth. For instance, in the sheath round the fibers of the sciatic nerve. But many specimens are too dense to be penetrated by electrons. If the specimen is put on a slide beneath the carbon rods, it is possible to make a cast or replica of the surface of the specimen. When a current is passed between the rods, the carbon vaporizes and then condenses all over the specimen, making the cast. Now the specimen itself is removed, 
so that only the cast is left. The carbon cast can easily be penetrated by electrons, yet an electron micrograph gives a poor impression of structure. This enlarged model of the cast shows how the problem has been solved. The cast is shadowed with a heavy metal such as platinum or gold. With an actual specimen, this is done in a vacuum. The resulting electron micrograph is reversed to make the shadows black. At the top of the instrument is the high energy field emission source or electron gun. The beam of electrons from the gun passes through a set of magnetic lenses which focus the electrons down to a very small spot. A set of scanning coils move the beam spot back and forth over the specimen in a raster pattern. Scattered electrons strike the annular detector and are converted into an electrical signal which is used to modulate the intensity of a TV display tube. The electron beam in the television display is moving in synchrony with the electron beam in the microscope. The magnification is the ratio of the distance the electron beam scans in the TV tube to the distance the beam scans in the microscope. The more material there is, the more scattering. The less material there is, the less scattering. This is the electron microscope. I'm afraid you can't see too many of the working details of it because they're all inside this very high vacuum container. But at least I can point out where inside these things are. At about this level in the microscope, there is the field emission source. Immediately below that, there is the magnetic lens. It's not very large, it's something about this size. It's about this level. Inside the magnetic lens, we insert the specimen. The specimen is controllable through these two mechanical motions so that we can move it around in space. We can insert the specimen into the microscope through this mechanism, which looks rather complicated, but nevertheless the specimen is inserted in here. This is also a high vacuum container so that we can insert the specimen into the lens without breaking the vacuum. That's the important part because the vacuum level is very high and difficult to attain. The ring detector, the annular detector, is immediately below the lens at about this level. I'm afraid you can see nothing, but it is inserted into the vacuum box from, from the side. The high voltage connections come in through here, including the connections for the field emission source and so on. All the electrical connections then go over into the control panel, which is over here. This is the control panel. It looks rather complicated, and it is. The picture appears on the screen here. If we want to look at single atoms and anybody speaks in the room, uh, you can't see them on the screen. And that's the reason for the, these curtains that go around the microscope. These are acoustic curtains. They're very heavy, leaded, vinyl curtains. And when we want to get to the highest possible resolution to see single atoms, then we have to close these curtains to keep all air vibrations away from the microscope. And only then is it possible to see them. The first atom pictures produced with the Chicago microscope were in black and white. Through the use of time-lapse photography, some six hours of single-frame photographs were compressed into about three minutes of viewing. Early analysis of the pictures led to some very crude categorizing of atom behavior. The individual atoms tended to merge and form clusters. Pairs of atoms appeared to move and dance together. There were indications that the heavier atoms attempt to interact with atoms in the substrate. Because the human eye has difficulty discriminating between various shades of black and white, the Chicago atom pictures have now been produced in color. By assigning a certain color to each level of brightness, discrimination is faster 
enabling researchers to more easily distinguish one type of atom from another. Seven different atom species have been photographed so far. Uranium, indium, silver, gold, cadmium, platinum, and palladium. In this particular sequence, we see uranium atoms moving on a carbon substrate.